Okay, well, uh, welcome to this celebration of the uh, summer solstice. No, sorry, that's, 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 that's the wrong place, sorry. <laughs> but uh, thank you all for coming, and I'd like to welcome you to this symposium, but also fast the Kim Light. Uh, my name is Herbert Winkle, and John Neves and I are the uh, co-organizers of this event. Well, we all know Gerard, the visionary. When I think of visionary, he is the picture that I see in my mind, right? So if I go to the dictionary and look up vis visionary, I see Gerard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, uh, before I get started, I should thank the people who made all this possible, our sponsors, who generously gave whenever we asked them. Because of their generosity, we're able to throw this free party and invite all of you to come and enjoy, have a nice couple of days. So let me thank uh, the College of Engineering at the University of Michigan. Uh, Dean Dave Monson generously donated a bunch of money. Uh, the physics department, the electrical and computer engineering division of the electrical engineering and computer science department, the University of Michigan Office of Research, the Applied Physics Program, and last but not least, the Army Research Office. Our thanks to Jacob Hammond, who's here with us today. Well, how did all this start? <laughs> Well, the, the genesis of this program was about, <laughs> about a year ago, I happened to run into Gerard. Now, it was actually in Hawaii. This is not Hawaii, but it was in Hawaii, and Gerard was walking around looking slim and fit, shirtless, as he likes to do during these conferences. <laughs> and... Uh, we got to talking, and Gerard told me, oh, you know, I'm going to be 70 next year. Now, I couldn't believe it. I said, boy, I wish I'd look this good when I turned 35. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so in this picture, you can't tell who is father and who is son. <laughs> but one of them is Julian, uh, Gerard's son. So, Gerard, before, I'd like to tell you about a few Michigan first, too, in, in optics. Yeah. Many of you don't know that uh, the first glass fat optical fiber was created here at the University of Michigan in 1906. Holography, the first practical hologram by Emmett Leeb and Yuri Kutatniak in 1963 was done here at the University of Michigan. And then a couple of years ago, we got to celebrate the birth of nonlinear optics. Uh, second harmonic generation was first observed here at the University of Michigan. Uh, these are the four people who did that. So we honored them a couple of years ago. And prior to that, there was a meeting in Suzhou, uh, Russia. There was uh, Alan Hill, a guy in the colored tie, uh, looking uh, there. Uh, he was one of the first people he was the first person to observe second harmonic generation here, and he was actually an undergrad when he did that. So we, we met in Suzdal. There's Gerard, there's Horatio Svelto, and uh, Mari Fair. And we decided that June 26, 1961, was the date on which the first observation of second harmonic generation occurred. So we settled the matter. So June is also a very great month for a lot of firsts here. The first use of the word laser, the first public use of the word laser was right here at the University of Michigan by Glenn Gould in a, in a conference. So it was on Wednesday, June 17, 1961. So there are a lot of firsts to celebrate in June. Okay. Another important achievement in Ann Arbor was one of the first laser companies was Tryon Instruments. 
was established in, I think, 1961, shortly after the invention of the laser. So Ann Arbor is a hotbed of laser and optic activity. And it is into this hotbed that Gerard landed uh, some years ago, and he created his unique stamp. He left his mark on the University of Michigan, on the state of Michigan, on the world. So now we have the Hercules laser here on campus, which set the world record for its highest focus intensity. All this based on Gerard's many achievements in optics, which we've gathered here to celebrate today. So, and welcome. And during the course of the day, you will hear more and more of Gerard's achievements, which span the range from ultrafast optical electronics to self pulse amplification to extreme light. You're going to hear all about that in this uh, symposium. So, I welcome you, and let me tell you about a few changes. Uh, Tracy Kajuma was supposed to be here in the extreme light session, but due to health reasons, he's not able to be with us today. So we wish him well. At, uh, let's see, at 4.40, you will gather for a group photo in the atrium of thousands of us. And the moment you've been waiting for, the arrival of coffee, <laughs> uh, it will be a little after 9.30. There will be coffee uh, set out there. Okay, So welcome, and we look forward to an exciting uh, couple of days. Uh, there's the banquet tonight, which I hope you will all attend. And tomorrow, there's the Sunday brunch in the Michigan League. Not in this building, but in the Michigan League. So. So I hope you'll all join us for that too. So at this point, I'd like to introduce Dave Munson, who is the Dean of the College of Engineering. Through his generosity, he's been able to uh, secure this event with Dave. Oh, you don't have, oh, you don't, oh, okay, I'm in this chair, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, Herb, and, and good morning, everyone. Uh, as Herb mentioned, I'm the Dean of Engineering here at the University of Michigan, and uh, had the privilege of being Gerard's colleague for a number of years uh, before he returned to France. So, welcome to Ann Arbor, and welcome to this academic birthday party for Gerard Moreau. Uh, I surmise we probably have individuals from lots of different countries here. And uh, if your team is doing well in the World Cup, then congratulations, you earned it. And if not, it was probably the referee's fault. So <laughs> don't worry. I want to reiterate the, the thanks Herb gave to the sponsors of this workshop, the Electrical and Computer Engineering Division of the EECS Department, the Physics Department, the Applied Physics Program, uh, the University of Michigan Office of Research, and the Army Research Lab. We'd like to sincerely thank all of you. So. And I, since, since Herb can't uh, sort of congratulate himself, I, I want to uh, sincerely thank Herb and John Neese and their able assistant, uh, Deborah Dieterle, for organizing all this. It doesn't happen by itself, and I think it's done a lot of work, and we're all going to profit from that throughout the day. So Herb, John, Deb, thanks. <laughs> well, what can we say about Gerard Moreau? And no, I don't have any more pictures. Uh, Gerard is, uh, he's had a pioneering career that has provided a legacy of breakthroughs uh, through which the world continues to build. His career has encompassed success across a 
wide spectrum of inquiry and applications in optics. And I'll name just a few things. Advances in picosecond optoelectronics, and as we all know, invention of the chirp pulse amplification concept, which enables the generation of laser light with extreme intensities needed for fundamental physics uh, at the level of quarks. Um, I actually have overlap with Girard there, even though I don't work in optics at all. I work in digital signal processing. I do a lot of radar. And uh, as many in this audience know, uh, pulse compression and radar, pulse compression and optics are the same thing and uh, equally useful on both sides. Um, Girard was uh, involved in the establishment of the Center for Ultrafast Optical Science, and we know that here on this campus as KUOS. Uh, KUOS is sponsored as a science and technology center by the National Science Foundation during the period 1990 to 2001. It continues as a Michigan engineering center focused on ultrafast optics with funding from a variety of government agencies and industry. It performs multidisciplinary research in the basic sciences and technological applications of ultra-short laser pulses uh, to educate students from a wide variety of backgrounds, including outside of engineering, uh, in this field and to spur the development of new technologies. It houses the Hercules laser that Herb just mentioned, which uh, set a world record for intensity in 2011. And KUOS has spawned companies such as Picometrics in Ann Arbor, a pioneer in terahertz technology, and also interlays, which led uh, the use of femtosecond lasers in eye surgery, and it's been used in more than 5 million procedures to date. In KUOS alone, it is clear that Girard has made scientific, technological, and economic impacts on the University of Michigan and also on the wider world. Girard illustrates so well, uh, I think, the global interdisciplinary ideals of Michigan engineering that we try to have here on our campus. And uh, in his research awards and travels, he truly embodies the notion of citizen engineer of the world. Girard is, uh, he belongs to all of us and, and we're so thankful for that. Uh, from the University of Michigan, a number of years ago, he returned home to France to propose the creation of a major European scientific collaborative project that I think most in this audience are familiar with, the Extreme Light Infrastructure, the ELI, and also, as many of you know, it's based in three countries. Uh, Gerard cannot be confined to one country. Uh, the Czech Republic, uh, Romania, and Hungary. The ELI is dedicated to the production of, once again, the most powerful laser uh, pulses in the world. Just since his last milestone birthday, which was, of course, a decade ago, he's received some of the highest scientific accolades presented by the French National Academy, the Chinese Academy of Science, the Optical Society of America, and leading academic institutions in Canada and Romania. He's a member of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering and a foreign member of the Russian Academy of Sciences. And uh, uh, as of several days ago, he already had received birthday wishes posted online uh, to this symposium's website from China, France, Germany, Italy, Switzerland, as well as the U.S. Well, the late Chuck Vest, who was a former Michigan of Engineering dean, and uh, I think you in this audience know a president from the National Academy of Engineering, uh, said this is the most exciting era for science and engineering in human history. Like all of the institutions represented here in this audience, the University of Michigan is an eager participant in this intellectual revolution. I'm pleased personally that this symposium includes a poster session by current students who certainly are on the front lines of this big adventure. I'd like to thank Gerard for your foundational role in helping make uh, very bright, no pun intended, uh, this future that we all dream about possible. And thank you, uh, Gerard, and everyone here for this opportunity to celebrate seminal contributions in this field. So thanks so much, and have a good day. first session is about the Rochester Dame, and it will be chaired by Tim Kafka.
morning. Yeah, let's just blow that, show that slide just one more time. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to copy that into my folder. <laughs> I think it's online already. Uh, which one? Let's see where did it go here. Uh, this this would be it right here. Oh, it's actually already running down here. Yeah. Yeah, Jim asked me to put an entirely music slide as an introduction, so that's what he got this morning. Yes, let's do it. Good morning. Our Rochester chapter begins in 1977. Gerard Moreau arrives at the uh, Laboratory for Laser Energetics in Rochester, in New York, and he promises his wife, Marcel, that they'll be back in France within just a few years. Uh, you'll know that it took a few decades and so uh, I think that's just an example of Gerard exceeding his predictions by a full order of magnitude. Test one, two. Test one, two. Test one, two. I am Jim Kafka, and in 1977, I was an undergraduate finishing up my degree in optics at the university. And our first speaker, Wayne Knox, was also an undergraduate. He was already at the laser lab before Gerard showed up. I was not. Uh, you'll likely know some things about Wayne, that after he finished his PhD working with Girard, he had a distinguished career at Bell Labs and then returned to be director of the Institute of Optics at the University of Rochester. What you may not know is about his music career. So I had the pleasure of actually performing with him on multiple instruments. I played oboe to his flute and his father playing clarinet at the laser lab. We played early music together. Wayne there played the lute. Right there. Ha -ha. <laughs> You have to look at the slide, Jim. <laughs> that would help. That was, it's right here. This was Jim's group, the, the Terpsichore Consort, was Jim's uh, early music group there. Yeah, I, Wayne actually took up a new instrument in order to join us. That was pretty this impressive. This is Jim over here. This one. Yeah. And then you'll know, at least for the last decade, Wayne has gone Hawaiian. So that means that he both composes and records on slack key guitar, among other instruments, and has taken on a Hawaiian name, as you can see here. So please welcome Wayne Timo Knox. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, if this works, maybe I'll stand over here. Uh, yeah, so that's what you asked for, Jim, so that's what you got there. Um, yeah, well, you know, it's actually really funny because my wife was always interested in Hawaiian culture, uh, even when she was really young in Rochester. She studied, there was one teacher in Rochester, New York that, 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 that taught her hula dancing. And so uh, when I first met her, she was like, I don't know, 15 years old, and she, she was dressed in a, in a grass skirt and doing Tahitian dancing. And you know, kind of caught my attention, you know. And so, <laughs> so when I started getting involved in the Nonlinear Optics Conference, you know, we started going to Hawaii every every two years. And then she said, "Well, this is great." So she really totally went into. Uh, she's now a, a trained Hawaiian um, hula teacher, a kumo. Okay, so she's trained to do kumo. Anyway, so so I just I just started bringing my guitar uh, stuff into Hawaii. Anyway, so next slide. Okay, so okay, so in the beginning here. Uh, the, the Rochester beginning, the, the Rochester Maru startup, or as they say, the, the Maruvians. And is Phil, Phil Buxbaum, Phil, are you out there? Is Phil? No, Phil didn't come. I think, isn't Phil the guy who coined the term the Maruvians? I think he's the one, yeah. Anyway, so, did, okay, Ger I, could somebody put a seatbelt on Gerard, please, here? Because this is, I, I figured I was the first speaker, we better get off to a, a good start, and especially following that great picture that Herb showed. So that, that's me there. And, and so what I decided to do is about uh, almost all of the talk is this stuff up here and only two slides about my latest uh, vision correction project. And I'll tell you all about that in two slides at the end. And then we can talk later this weekend if you want to hear more. Anyway, first, um, and Herb, uh, and actually John, I didn't have a picture of you this morning, but I, I just want to say, can we thank Herb uh, for all this? <laughs> Herb, you remember what, um, that when I was uh, General Sheriff Cleo, we had the presidential suite in, in Baltimore, and so we sat and played jazz piano together, and that was truly fun, and we should do that again sometime. So. But you're way better than I am. But anyway, Herb, there's one little tiny correction I'd like to, to offer to you okay, in your slide, because you said that University of Michigan um, was the place where fiber w was invented, right? And, you, and you, you said it was the first glass-clad fiber. Now, if in Jeff Heck's book okay, on the history of fiber optics, there's a picture of this undergraduate student in Michigan winding it on, a, on, a, on an oatmeal box, right? But it was a glass fiber. I wouldn't have said it was a glass clad fiber. Glass fiber, not a glass clad fiber, right? So, so Herb, where was the idea of the cladding on a fiber invented? The obvious answer, University of Rochester. Uh, 
It was invented by uh, Brian O'Brien, the director of the Institute of Optics. So he, he had the idea to put a cladding on to lower the losses. Anyway, so just, if you just change that one word, then you are good to go. <laughs> okay, so we do start at the beginning. And you know, you guys all know about Kodak and Rochester, and you hear about the big changes in Rochester. But do you realize that the whole laser lab started because of Kodak, right? Uh, yeah, sure you know. Of course you know. <laughs> and, uh, and so they had a, uh, uh, a glass laser program there. They were going to develop a line of medical lasers, right? They had all this great stuff. And then they decided, you know, we're, we're, a, we're a film company. What are we doing with this crazy stuff? So they were going to dump all these lasers. And of course, Mike Herser was a young faculty member there. Um, looks like a guy in a motorcycle gang here, right? Um, and um, so he said, I'll take all those, right? So he grabbed a bunch of these lasers. And he started, um, he started key switching them and uh, did some of the earliest, earliest um, studies of that, and he focused it in the air, and it went zap, okay? The spark in the air. It wasn't a femtosecond pulse that hit a lot, lot of energy, long pulse. But anyway, this guy, Moshe Lubin, saw that, a young assistant professor of mechanical engineering and aerospace sciences, and he said that, cool, let's build a really big laser. <laughs> and that, I tell you, is literally the spark that, that started the whole laser lab. These, these slides that I have, some of these slides um, here are from a, 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 a collection that John Therese put together here. John gave me the slides. So Bob Hopkins, of course, you know many, and Emma Wolf founded the Rochester Coherence Conference there. Um, and so, um, so what was really interesting was that there was this little building, the Maury Annex building, and, um, and, and the, the timing was that I was a freshman at RIT, and I just heard uh, one professor saying there might be some summer jobs at the laser lab. I said, laser, laser, ooh, that's cool. That's all I had to hear, job and laser. <laughs> and I said, what could be better? So, uh, so I went to see Moshe Lubin. He looked at my resume and he said, you're hired. Okay, when do you want to start? I said, maybe this summer. He said, no, just start right now. <coughs> okay, so he went right next door. Bedros, I'm looking at Bedros because I don't have time to talk slow, okay? So, so here, I'm going to speak faster now. Okay, so Moshe Lubin went. Wolf Sika said, I'll take him. Okay, and then I was working at the laser lab. It turns out that the university had been doing research with monkeys, okay, in that building, and they left all the cages full of the monkey poop, okay? <laughs> and they told me that I arrived two weeks after they got all the monkey poop out of the cages, okay? They got all cleaned out, and so I arrived in perfect timing. So this was like spring of 1976. That's when I started there. I was still at RIT. So um, I started working with Wolf Sika. You see Wolf there. Wolf is, yes, he's still there at the laser lab, and he still looks exactly the same. <laughs> And this was the project I was working on when I was 18 years old, right? I mean, what could be more fantastic than that? Just a little tiny kid. And uh, at the laser lab, they still think of me as being 18 years old. Anyway, so there's Wolf. Um, and so I joined there, 76, working with Wolf. And so he had me already working on possible cells. And, and, um, and I had that fantastic uh, uh, to be there. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you'll see Gerard is not in the picture here. Uh, but you'll see John Therese. You'll see Moshe Lubin here. And that's Claudia, for those of you who remember Claudia. Anyway, so anyway, moving quickly along here. This is me right here. And <laughs> you see in my painter's pants, this is Sam Lettering and uh, oh, just Steve Kump and a bunch of other people here. Larry Fonsi, you remember the, the fourth guy? Uh, Larry Fourth Steve. Um, anyway, so I had that experience of standing in the gravel before the building was even built. And that was truly, truly exciting. And I tell you, I'll tell you, I never forgot that experience of being in that photo. So exciting. Um, and so the laser lab was built, and you'll see the numbers back then were very tiny. Uh, the numbers are much bigger now. Um, and so they built the mega laser. Now, um, actually, uh, there, um, the glass uh, development laser, which uh, had other very unkind uh, other acronyms for the, uh, yeah, anyway, the goddamn laser. It never worked. Anyway, no, but it did work. But anyway, here we go. So, uh, so they put me in charge of making apodized apertures. It was an undergraduate project I had to clean up the beam edges, and I did that. Um, we had a brand new laser bay. This, this entire room was empty, and it had a beautiful orange epoxy floor, and we played Frisbee. Wh who played Frisbee with me there? Any, any of you played Frisbee with me there? No. Okay, so anyway, that was when it was completely empty. I worked on the oscillator with Wolf and Joe Bunkenberg. We built the oscillator for the first Omega system, and they used that for quite a long time. They put me in charge of all the time-resolved diagnostics. I was a sophomore. Uh, what was that, junior? Undergraduate. Bang, laser fires, I'm running around advancing all the film on all the street cameras, okay? And then when the packs are full, I go to the dark, dark room, develop the black and white film, run into the densitometer, scan each one in the densitometer, print it out on paper, digitize it on a hand digitizing platen, 
and then cross correlate them all, I come back 193 picoseconds plus or minus 50. No, but uh, <laughs> I was doing that as an undergraduate. I, I really don't know how many hours I was working. You know, students are not allowed to work that many hours anymore. Um, Donna, uh, where's Doug? Doug? Doug. The espresso machine, Doug, okay. You still have the espresso machine. We could not have built that laser without, we literally were drinking espresso all the time. So anyway, uh, here, uh, then this, this uh, French guy showed up. Okay, and so, you know, the, the thing was amazing, Gerard. I, I really don't remember our first discussion, but, but it might have involved high voltage. And, and what you probably didn't realize, because I had already been working on with all the picosecond lasers with Wolf and all this stuff, and, and, and you may have said, you know, well, I've got this, this idea, you know, maybe we could you know, switch high voltage or something. I don't know, I don't know, because it was like a, a little Austin switch, maybe make a really big one, right? And so I, I don't remember the first discussion, but if you don't, if, if, you, if it involved the word high voltage, then the thing you didn't realize was that ever since I was a tiny kid, I was always insane crazy about high voltage. I, I was building high voltage power supplies when I was like eight years old in my basement. <laughs> Uh, because my dad would bring this stuff home from the physics department. So, so you asked me if I want to work on high voltage and lasers. What could be better? So we did that, and so that was my first publication as a as an un, as a senior. I was a senior in 1979. I had not become a graduate student yet, but um, but that was my introduction to working with Gerard. So so that's why if anybody asked me, um, I, I was the minus one member of Gerard's Rochester group because I was there before him. So I would guess I'll be the minus one and the plus one member of, of Gerard's group. So um, then, you know, I was taking optics there, and then um, uh, this obviously is not a picture of Steve Williamson, right? <laughs> <laughs> you, th you thought I made a mistake there, right? Well, so no, because I was taking optics 261 with, you know, Brian Thompson, uh, probably one of the best teachers in the whole world. He, he still looks exactly the same, exactly the same as that now, and he's around doing great stuff. And so uh, taking optics 261, and sitting behind me is, is this, this kid and he's talking to another kid about how, you know, he's working in a bicycle store. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, he's, um, um, it, uh, and I just, I went to see Gerard. And, and I said, Gerard, there's this really, really smart guy sitting behind me in the optics class. He's working in a bicycle store. Could we find a better job for him? So Gerard says, where are you, Steve? Where are you? Where are you? So Steve, meet Gerard, right? So Steve, I think, was the number two. Anyway, okay, so there you go. Um, so there we go. Uh, while I built this, uh, then Gerard said, "Yeah, well, I got this great idea. Uh, so, so let's uh, let's let's drive a street camera. Oh yeah, great. Okay, I got plenty of time. So I did that. And so, um, so I built the system, and you all know about that. I found this moldy old photo just a couple of weeks ago, and that's just I'm sorry about the hairy chest there, but it doesn't it doesn't compete with Gerard at all there. But but anyway, um, okay. So we did that, and there was a patent that we uh, that we wrote together, and that uh, was a very long time ago." Tremendous amount of fun. Okay, so then the group hit the uh, uh, Europe for the ultrafast phenomena meeting, and that was Gerard. I think uh, I think Europe really took notice of what was going on in the group, right? So here we are. Gerard and I decided to go down to Innsbruck one day, um, and we just I just got a really great picture. You see how he's staring off into nowhere, right? He's not listening to anything I'm saying. You know, he's just like, oh my God, I got another great idea. So. Uh, <laughs> Elba, I told you, Elba, I told you I would show a picture of Steve and Giannis in bed together. I told you that. Right? <laughs> so I, I warned her last night. She said it was okay. So they're work, working hard, of course, always. And, you know, Gerard usually puts six, of eight of eight, six or eight of us in every room, hotel room at a conference, right? Especially Baltimore. I remember Giannis, uh, Earl, the one where Earl went, went out and stood on the ledge. Earl, do you remember that? Yeah, we'll tell that story later after people have had a few drinks. Here's our trip uh, to the middle of foggy nowhere. Do you remember that? Um, up in the Alps there, I didn't even know why we, but they kept telling us we had to go up there. And we got up there with just absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing to see. Uh, here you may see more of these, a delightful picnic there with Gerard teaching us how to eat cheese, which is important to know. Uh, Gerard said, Wayne, you like music. Um, Gerard was studying violin. Um, and so Gerard said, let's go to this violin maker museum. Um, was it the Gegenbauer Museum, the Gegenbauer? Um, so, so we took train, went all the way down there, and we got there and said, closed. Of course it was closed, Gerard. Anyway, so we just spent the whole day watching hang gliders and had a great time together. Um, and then I stayed behind um, working um, on, on uh, I, I built the jitter-free street camera at Enska. I stayed behind for a few more weeks while the rest of the guys had a great trip on the TGV, right? So Steve, <laughs> you guys are going to tell the TGV story because that's a really bad one. They, they, anyway, you'll hear it later. 
Okay, so again, more beautiful pictures um, here. Uh, at one point, uh, Janis has really had enough. We're driving to, to Vienna for IQEC. You see Janis is just, and Gerard, of course, is having a great time there. Well, as you know, um, every time we got together at Clio, we tried to take uh, Rochester Mafia pictures, and you'll see them. Uh, we had some non moruvian Rochester Mafias here. You see Walmsley over here and Mark Beck, a Walmsley student. And you'll see uh, down here, you'll see Jim, Jim, there you are in the back, Donna, um, Greg right here, Steve, Earl, um, there's Jeff, and there's Mark, and there's Hugo down there. Okay, so there you are, Donna, of course, and you're going to hear all about this. And, um, and there's really great stories about how that happened. There's uh, Madame Past President, and thank you for doing that, Donna. Beautiful. That's fantastic. Well, and then I started interviewing, okay? And, um, and I, I interviewed at Hughes Research Labs. And when I interviewed at Hughes Research Labs, um, this one, one guy uh, took me aside, Connie Giuliano, and said, Wayne, you give a great talk, and, and you're going to get a job offer. But one piece of advice, lose the vest. <laughs> this is California, Wayne. You don't have to be like, you know, this uptight East Coast guy there. Okay, so, so I did. I lost the vest. But while I was waiting to get that job offer from Hughes, Gerard kept telling me, you know, Hughes is a good place, but Wayne, there's only one place for you. You've got to go to La Bella Labza. <laughs> La Bella Labza is the only place for you to go. I said, yeah, Gerard, look, I don't have any offer from jobs. I'm, I'm going to Hughes, so just, I'm out of here, okay? So, um, so then one day, he comes running to my desk. I'm literally sitting there waiting for the job offer. And he says, Wayne, he says, you can go to Bell Labs. I said, what are you talking about? He said, yeah, my buddy, my friend's buddy, my Pied Noir from Tunisia, uh, da Daniel Semler, he, he called me and he's looking for two postdocs. I said, okay, great. So sure enough, I got the instantaneously got a job offer there. We headed off to New Jersey. I worked with Dave Miller um, and Daniel Semler. So I realized all of a sudden, um, what is this? I've had seven years of French colonial rule. <laughs> now I've ended up with 14 years of French colonial rule. Okay? <laughs> so, there, a, after 14 years of French colonial rule, there's only one way to get even with, with both. Now, uh, unfortunately, Danielle, as you know, died very tragically of a brain aneurysm and very tough, and, and we miss him a lot. And Barrett, of course, also later died of breast cancer. So he's not here to defend himself. And Marcel's going to hold Gerard down while I show the next slide. And, I've, and, and I would like to apologize to all the French people in the room here, okay? <laughs> Except to Gerard. Okay, so, okay, so. <laughs> My name is Pierre. The great radar. Now, do you remember? Do you remember when when they discovered this, the Titanic wreck? It was discovered by a French team. Okay, this comet came out. Okay, my name is Pierre, the great radar of the sunken Titanic. But do people say here comes Pierre, the great engineer, the great explorer, the great brave diver? Do they say this? They do not. <laughs> Instead, they say here comes Pierre. The grave piece of crater, despicable robber, cheap, tacky, insensitive opportunist. These people, what do they expect from me, eh? I'm French. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, uh, Gerard and Marcel, you will not believe I found this, but Gerard and his sons studied violin with Boris Zapososny, right? Zapososny. At the Eastman School of Music, there you are, Marcel, right there. And Gerard, uh, not his finger and his nose there, but it's close. But you see, you see, he said, you know, how does he do that? He was learning how to play violin. And there's another one here. See, again, really nice picture. How did I ever get this picture yesterday at 6 p.m.? Well, it turns out his son is all grown up now, Gerard. Alex, that's his son. And, and they send their wishes to you, your whole family, from the Zaposhezny. He's a lawyer, and he's helping me start a company now. Okay, so. That's an amazing thing, Marcel. I'll tell you about that later. Anyway, Gerard, your favorite topic, Bell Labs. I was a postdoc. I took over Chuck, uh, Chuck Tank's lab. I was like in a million dollar sandbox, and I saw a copper vapor laser. And I said, well, you know, those Rochester guys are working on amplifying femtosecond pulses. I think I have a, a, different, a different way to do that. So I, so I convinced Chuck to get me a copper vapor laser. I brought it into his lab. Uh, it came on a Monday. On, uh, on the Wednesday, the technician turned it on, showed me how to run it. And on that Friday, I had the first kilohertz white light continuum. Gerard, took me two days to do it because it was so simple, right? Just a little pile of Edmund optics. Um, 1986, copper vapor lasers were taking over the world. Gerard, there were over 130 copper vapor amplified femtosecond systems in the whole world. 
and you guys were making fun of it, uh, but I learned a lot of things from Chuck Shank. I learned put your initials on the line tool so that everybody sees your initials on the front cover of Laser Focus. <laughs> there you go. And despite the fact there were 130 of these in the whole world, Gerard, there was never a copper vapor system in Rochester. No, there wasn't, of course not, because you guys had your own way of doing it. And so, so th this was the beautiful colliding pulse mode lock laser uh, that was not invented by Chung Chang. Anyway, so uh, Gerard, so right <laughs> Here was our paper here, and you can see uh, the kilohertz white light here. Received September, September 4th, remember that date, okay? And there was the bow tie amplifier that Earl, you guys made a lot of fun of. Todd, are you here? Does Todd Sizer make it here? Todd didn't make it? Ah, too bad, anyway. Okay, anyway, everybody making fun of my bow tie, but you see it was received September 4th, and it was, see Gerard, it was non-chirp pulse amplification. It was the opposite. My goal was to keep the pulse as short as possible while I was amplifying it so I didn't have to waste energy in a compression stage. Anyway, it worked great. Um, <laughs> so here, as you see now, received more than a month later, Earl <coughs> and Philippe, and uh, again, so, sorry, sorry, but, and Ted, sorry about this. But uh, there you go, and they even published an asymmetric autocorrelation, look at this. I mean, come on guys, how could you do that? We'll talk about it later. Okay, <laughs> so you see Giannis in the back here. Giannis, you'll remember, right? that in this beautiful colliding pulse mode lock laser that we had in Chuck Shank's lab, it was running around 60 cents a second pulses. And Giannis built, he, he then was an MTS in Murray Hill. Giannis built his own laser in Murray Hill. And he, I think if Giannis, if I remember it right, um, he put a wrong mirror in the corner. He put a Heaney mirror in the corner. And he got this really red laser, really red wavelength and really short pulses. So he called up Dick Fork and Dick said, great, bring the mirror down, right? So we popped it in. And all of a sudden we had 20 something, 27, or 27 cents a second. So, so Yana said, but this is, you know, like it's the Heaney mirrors. It's the only one I have that works. No, none other one works. So, so Dick, he cut it in half, didn't he? And we kept half in Hendel. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, with that, you see, we had now 35 cents a second amplified pulses. Chuck Shank uh, walks in my office and says, Wayne, oops, he says, Wayne, uh, you, this guy, Dan Griskowski. Dan, you're not here, are you? No, Dan Griskowski. Uh, you know, this guy at IBM, right? Earl was a postdoc. No, he made these 12 cents a second pulses and really pissed off Chuck because the previous record, the 30 cents a second, was, was MIT, you know, I Ippen and Andy Weiner. And then, uh, you know, Chuck Shank, Chuck, no, no, it was the other way around. It was 30 cents a second, this Chuck's lab. And 16 cents a second, Andy Weiner and Eric Ippen. And then these IBM guys, you know, the 12 cents a second, that was illegal because it wasn't a factor of two. Okay, you had to, if you're gonna make a new world, it has to be a factor of two. So Chuck gave me the job of beating IBM, beating Dan Griskowski, and, and I, I walked in his, his office one day, I said, Chuck, I got 11 cents a second. He said, not good enough, go back, okay? <laughs> so, uh, so I did finally get it down to eight cents a second, but Giannis is, is there um, helping us with that, and that was, that was just a fantastic fun time to see Mike Downer, um, and then Dick Fork and Fred Beiser. So Chuck said, okay, this guy, I gotta give him his own lab. He's not gonna be a postdoc anymore. So he was very generous with my lab space, you see, and with equipment. Um, this was my, my first uh, setup. No, but seriously, this was my white light interferometer for measuring dispersion. And um, this is the 24th anniversary of this, and I'm not gonna talk about this, but <laughs> it is absolutely true, it's true, okay? So there it is, and still zero femtoseconds is still shorter than your antosecond pulses. <laughs> And that was the reason, one of the reasons I did it. Okay, I said, no matter what you guys do, uh, the zero femtoseconds seconds is still shorter than anything. Okay, so I started getting into education. This is my son. This is the point at which I'm gonna remind you how much we have all grown up here, okay? And so started getting involved in education. This was the path that led me to the university, which I never predicted or never expected. Here he is now. Those of you who were in the group in 1980, raise your hand, okay? It, those of you who were in Gerard's group in 1980, you, yeah, so you guys will remember the day I walked in there with, with him, he was just a few months old. So here he is now, 34 years old. So that's how old we are now. He has a five-year-old daughter. Um, and this is our 18-year-old our daughter, Wailea. And this is our uh, son here, uh, Scott, 16, Orlando, 14. And this is our 12-year-old daughter who is way too grown up now. Uh, she's, she's 12 years old going on, on 21 or something like that. And then that's my mom and dad, for those of you who I know. Wanted to see a picture of my mom and dad, they're still doing really well. And this is me trying to keep track of all this stuff here. Okay, so here we are. Um, this is something for the IMRA guys out here. So you know that, that, that I got really interested in, in compact diode pump femtosecond lasers, invented the satural brag refractor, uh, <laughs> satural brag reflector, 
uh, which is not an ASTSA or a you know that, it's just different. different. Uh, and here, what I did was, in order to make sure that it didn't get killed by power transients, I plugged it into a UPS, just like a computer. And then what happened was I met Winfred Jenks, and I said, well, this, I've got to take this up to, um, up to Murray Hill, because their microscope was too big to move down. This was the first time in history that it was easier to move a femtosecond laser than a microscope. Okay, and so I put it in the back of my Ford Explorer, brand new, 1994 Ford Explorer, and this is my daughter here, who was born in August 1994. You see, this dates it really nicely. So this put it in the back of my Explorer to drive it up to Murray Hill, and I put the UPS next to it, and I realized, what the hell? I mean, there's no place to plug it in. I might as well turn it on, right? So I started it up, and it was mode locking in my driveway there, in, in the car. And, and so I, I thought, so this is really cool, because we had argon lasers, we had dye, you know, shifting all over us. We had all this bad stuff, and this was really amazing. We were gonna go do the first uh, two photon um, measurements of rat brain neurons and, and do that with this laser. And so I, I showed this, I, I, I put it and I put it in the laser focus uh, magazine or something. So the IMRA guys picked it up, <laughs> Don Harder, okay? And so, um, and Greg Suha I heard last night. So this is what I published and they returned this to me a few months later, okay, this picture. <laughs> Okay, so you see that they were making fun of me now, and, um, and so, so uh, Greg, last night at dinner I asked Don, Greg Suha, Greg, where are you? Um, what, there you are. Okay, I, I asked Don Harder um, who really did the dirty work on this. So you see what they did was they photoshopped out my laser, and they put their little tiny fiber laser on my daughter's lap and sent it back to me. And um, so that was their response. And I, is that also true that you guys put it in a canoe and you, you had a picture <laughs> Right, you, you put it in a, in a canoe and had a picture of that going down the river somewhere. Maybe Philippe Bedell would know that or something. I don't know, he could, could tell us about that. Um, but anyway, um, just to let you know, that was her in 2002. Here's an update, here she is now, that's the same little girl. And now she's getting married in August 1st in Kauai, there she is. So again, that's how much time has passed since we made those compact diode pump femtosecond lasers. And you remember that picture of me standing in the gravel, um, and I said I never forgot that. So it was my turn to do that when I came back to the university to build optics and biomedical engineering building. Here we are in the front, and you recognize a bunch of people there. That was great. So now I'm gonna just spend just two slides on my latest research because when I came back to Rochester, um, I started a very tiny project in femtosecond micromachining, and I was asked to go to Bausch and Lomb and, and talk about that, and we, we thought maybe it has something useful to be engaged in. And so I talked about that, and we started a project that has gotten really excited now. So so basically, and there are no regens, Gerard, there are no amplifiers in this, I'm so sorry, just based on oscillator 82 megahertz. And what we do is we focus into hydrogel polymers. You could think of hydrogel polymers like uh, the materials like make soft contact lenses, okay? Those are kind of like typically HEMA-based uh, polymers. And we can write custom um, astigmatic correctors. This is a, an example of a, a Twyman green interferogram. Shows cross minus one diopter cylinders in hydrogel. When you go to the optometrist, they will tell you how much sphere and how much cylinder you need. That's what your glasses or your contact lenses are. So we can fully customize this now in, in hydrogels. And there are a lot of exciting applications in customizing intraocular lenses and contact lenses. And I'll just tell you one thing. Um, uh, contact lens manufacturing is a big business, but it turns out that the inventory control is huge. They need to keep 25,000 different combinations of prescriptions in stock for all the different eyes, to fit all the different eyes. And we're looking at a new way to, uh, to do a customizing of that. And it's very exciting. So that's that intraocular lens and contact lenses. And we've done some really very neat stuff lately, right, right in custom refractive correctors. On the other side, you know all about uh, LASIK, you know all about interlays, you know all about all of that. And I'm not, uh, again, I'm, I'm doing exactly the opposite of that, okay? With LASIK, what you do is you'll cut the cornea, flap open, you'll ablate, and you'll change the shape of the cornea, and that will change the refractive power of the eye. The cornea has about two-thirds of all the refractive power in the eye. What we're doing is, of course, uh, we would say in Bell Labs, it's exactly the same thing, but it's totally different, right? That's what we would say. So here, we're, we're changing the refractive power of the eye by changing the refractive index of the cornea. And you may wonder, can you change the refractive index of a living biological tissue? Uh, the answer is yes. And um, unlike LASIK, we don't cut a flap, we leave the shape the same, but we change the refractive index. And the way we do that, um, as it turns out, I discovered a very interesting set of parameters, 100 femtosecond pulses, 400 nanometers, which is not UV, 
blue light, um, 82 megahertz, about 80 milliwatts, and water immersion NA 1.0 with slight acclimation. And what we do is we focus into the cornea and we're saying, is there a kinder, gentler approach to vision correction that would be not LASIK, uh, involving, not involving cutting and ablating the corneal tissue? So we rapidly scan it like that, and then we have written a new lens inside there. Now, we call this blue iris intrus tissue refractive index shaping. And um, we just had a, a, a beautiful patent published last year. We have actually 18 patents um, going through the system. The first five are all alive now, um, all owned by the University of Rochester. Our goal is to develop this into a safe alternative to LASIK. Um, the real goal is kind of audacious, uh, a non-invasive lunchtime procedure. But what, what really, what we really want to do is, is to, uh, not, not a little thing, it's actually to, to completely change the way that vision correction is done, completely change it. So you will know that if you go to the optometrist and you just need a small correction, they're not gonna give you something new. They'll wait till the correction becomes bigger. Well, what we're thinking is that we want to be able to have you come in maybe every six months or so and get a small correction, small correction, another small correction, every six months if you need it, year, two years, whatever you need. Um, completely different way of doing that. As you know, with your kids, 10, 12, 14 years old, they're growing rapidly, their eyes are changing. We've all gone through this kind of thing. So here's an update. Um, we've demonstrated in live cats, <laughs> okay, uh, because we, we're not allowed to do this in humans yet, but we, we will be soon, um, that we've demonstrated out to uh, 15 months, we wrote a minus one cylinder, um, in the left eye and in the right eye, one at 15 months, one at five months, and the cat stares into a wavefront uh, meter and we measure the refractive change while the cat stares at, at, at a little red dot and eats cat food like this, okay? And um, so, so that, that demonstrates that, that it works in, uh, in a living system like that, which of course is totally different than a non-living system. Next will be humans like that, and I think you all, you all know that uh, Clark Kent you know, wears glasses and Superman doesn't, obviously, and you all wondered how he did that, but we hope to, to fix that. So, so right now, I'm on leave from the university for, for this year, actually through June 30th, um, and, and now we're getting ready to start a company. So anybody who would like, we're, we're going to be looking for a few good people, so anybody who likes the weather in Rochester better than where you are, um, <laughs> talk to me over coffee. So Gerard, back to you. This is where it gets really painful, okay. <laughs> So we know Gerard, we all know Gerard. Look at his science citation, okay? Look at this, I mean, from those Rochester days, right? Right here, he was only getting a couple hundred citations per year, up to he's getting more than a thousand citations per year. Now, this is not because he's getting lazy, this is just because it's only June. So, <laughs> anyway, I know it looks bad, I should have cut that off. But anyway, um, but now we expect it's gonna, and, and it's kind of flattening out here, Gerard, you know, but you know, so you gotta go. You're not getting older, you're getting better, seriously. Okay, yeah, really true. But 326 publications, his Hearst index is 66, y'all, which is very, very amazing. Um, he has 29 US patents, 78 according to the International Patent Office. But one thing you didn't know about Gerard, I'm sure, it, does is anybody in this room know this fact about Gerard? The, what I, what's on, does anybody know this? Okay, good. So I discovered there are, your name is so fantastic. There are 1,264 different ways to rearrange <laughs> the letters of your name, okay? Now here's, how, here's how, what you're supposed to do, okay? So you do the anagram list, and it, I can tell you it took me a long time to read through this whole list of 1,264, and you have to pick the ones that describe him best, okay? So, so road, rogue, rum, and if you don't believe me, you can try to rearrange, I'm, I'm, you, you don't have to waste your time, it's really true, okay? Road, rogue, rum. Red ego rumor, <laughs> uh, maybe. So you have to see which one fits him best. And I'm gonna show you at the bottom of the slide the one that I decided would be best, but we can vote on it if you want. Argue odor rum. Uh, the rad Romeo guru. What do you think about that, Marcel? <laughs> That's pretty good, isn't it? Is he the rad Romeo guru? Um, the AIDS rod rumor? <laughs> the mare odor guru. Well, you know, the, this guru kept coming up over and over, and I thought, there's something to this guru thing, I like it, okay? The aged dour rumor, the rage odor rum, ream odor guru, that's not good. 
our God rumor. There's the religious ones, right? Our God rumor. The rare doom guru. That's definitely not him. He's my, the rare mood guru. Well, some are just kind of insane, like, the, he, well, the rear mood guru. This, some are just insane. The God <laughs> urea rumor. <laughs> that you, you, you simply can't make any sense out of that. That's no way that you can get a context for that. The Rome Road Guru, no, but that's not really hitting. I want a better guru. I'm looking for the best guru that I decided, okay. And roaming Euro for drugs is not a good thing to do. <laughs> Gerard, don't, don't do that, but isn't that amazing? Isn't that just totally amazing? Our, um, our God? <laughs> well, we had some last night. It was not bad, right? Um, Rue, our arm dog. Is Gerard a rude rug more? No, I don't think so. Now, Marcel. I'm more doer. On the rug, okay. <laughs> so this is getting closer, but then there's also Amur redo on the rug. Okay, so <laughs> I don't know. This is not going in the right direction here, but it, but it could be. Now it gets close to it. The roar mode guru. Okay, but now the one I like the best, and you know if you like it, you, know, you can have none. But here's the one I like. You are the roar demo guru. There you go, <laughs> because you know. <laughs> Because we, we learned how to do demos from the best, okay? That's what we learned, how you do a demo. And um, so thanks, Gerard. Here you are again in Innsbruck, staring off into minus infinity or wherever you're looking at. Um, thanks for all the great support, for the great mentoring, the, all the understanding, all the leadership, all the inspiration, um, all the challenges. That, because this is probably, as a professor now, what I realize is probably the most important things we do for our students we tell them that PhD research should be nearly impossible, right? It shouldn't be actually impossible, but it should be nearly impossible because then other people can't do it, right? So that's the idea. So those challenges that you gave us, were, 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 we learned that from you. All the guidance, um, all the ideas, Gerard, the crazy ideas, <laughs> um, the insane ideas, Gerard, um, like the mega dual fiber laser. No, that's not, that, what kind of an idea is that? <laughs> How about this one? The really bad ideas like the pissing mirror. <laughs> um, there are only a few of you out there that know what that is, right? Earl? Yeah. Yes, Earl. There are only a few of you out there that know what the, about the pissing mirror, yes. So I thought Tom was the one. That, yeah, anyway, that was a bad idea. Um, for all the help, for kicking the ass when we needed it, which we needed all, we all needed that once in a while, and all the things you are going to do in the future, okay? All the things you're going to do in the future. So. So there's a couple things you're going to do in the future. Um, so one of the things you're going to do in the future is, is you're going to come to the Nonlinear Optics Conference next summer. And a bunch of you are going to come. I know you are going to come. <laughs> um, so that's going to be uh, July 26th to 31st in back at the good old Kauai Marriott Resort. Um, Marty Kahn and I'm a general chair together. And we picked the most awesome Herb Winfell again as program co-chair. Right? So. I asked Herb, Herb, you know, we, we need a, a, a really, really you know, excellent program chair for nonlinear optics, just like the best meeting ever. And, and Herb, you know, we, we'd like to ask you if you, if you, if you would like to do this. And he says, um, yeah, yeah, I think so. <laughs> and I said, well, Herb, you know, um, you know Herb, uh, what, what I'd like to really know is, is, is are you going to do an enthusiastic review? He says, oh, yes, I would love to do it, Wayne. <laughs> you got the job, Herb. That was it. So, um, so Gerard, um, my wife was not able to be here, so she sends you a hug like that, and, um, and we'll be there in, in Hawaii. And, um, and Marcel, there you are, you see right here? Uh, because we've been running this, this Hawaiian cultural workshop at the Nonlinear Optics meeting, so there's Marcel dancing. This is Steve Kendall's wife there, my wife there. So there you are, Marcel, and uh, thank you, Marcel, uh, because you know and we all know that uh, Gerard could not have done anything at all without you. So thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Well, he didn't. Was I supposed to? Oh, okay. What, who's next? Yana? That would be the one question we're not going to have, Earl. Uh, you're next? You're next? 
Ja, natuurlijk. Cool. Wordt er daar gemaakt? Dank je. Cool. Dank je. So, I think all of us would love to think like Gerard, given his creativity, given his vision, but of course, Gerard's unique. There's only one Gerard. But I can help you sound like Gerard, or at least the version from the 1980s that we all uh, learned. You, you need to know that when you go into a room with your colleagues and you want to know what's happening, you have to either ask them, what's on the tap? Or you have to ask them, what's the skinny? <laughs> and then if they tell you something really wonderful, you have to reply, guys, I love that. I love that. <laughs> and then at least you'll sound a little bit like him. Um, one advantage of being the uh, presider is you get to take everybody's photo. You will know what... Uh, that it sounds entirely nerdy, but on the other hand, you're all going to want a copy when it's done, aren't you? So. Great. <laughs> so, our next speaker is Janis Valmanis, and he arrived in Rochester from Purdue in 1978, and then came to the Laser Lab in 1980. Uh, you'll likely know that after he finished his PhD working with Girard, he had a distinguished career also at Bell Labs, and then he came here to the University of Michigan, he was the first employee at Picometrics, founded by Steve Williamson, and you'll hear that story in the next session. Um, and his most recent adventure is setting up a new business here in Ann Arbor for Thor Labs. What you may not know is about um, Giannis's athletic career. I had the pleasure of playing a bunch of volleyball with him in grad school, but I didn't dare step on the tennis court at the same time. He was way out of my league. Um, if you like, uh, later you can ask me about what it's like to go to a Latvian wedding where you're one of the few people who doesn't speak Latvian. Um, if you'd like to know how these pictures actually came to be, you should ask Earl uh, during the next break. Um, and if you want to know about playing squash versus Gerard, then you have to ask Giannis during, during the coffee break. So please welcome Giannis Valdmanis.